Good evening. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us for the April 10th, 2018 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission. Would everyone please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Since our most recent county commission meeting, <clears throat> Richard Sales, our longtime fire chief for the Reynolds District, and Johnny Wilson, Reams Creek Assistant Chief and EMS 911 Supervisor, have passed away. I wanted to take a moment on behalf of the county commissioners to express our condolences to their families and to let them know that they will be in our prayers. Richard Sales and Johnny Wilson were men of integrity and compassion who dedicated their lives to public service and protecting life. We will miss them and are grateful for their service and commitment to our community. The Christian scriptures say that nothing can separate us from God's love. So let us take a moment of silence for prayer and reflection for the lives of Richard Sales and Johnny Wilson and for their family and friends as well as fellow firefighters as they mourn the loss of these beloved men and celebrate their lives. So please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, before we begin our meeting, I'd like to ask everyone to please silence your cell phones or place them on mute. And let me uh, read the ethics reminder to the board. <clears throat> In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which will have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Also, does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on all items that the board votes on this evening. Um, one item I neglected to mention <clears throat> when I was re reviewing the agenda is that we will have, uh, in addition to the items I mentioned, we will have public comment at the end of the meeting, um, and we will also have public comment on any matters that we vote on uh, this evening as well, at the time we vote on them. All right. Um, so w we, need to, we need to add, do we need to add the presentation from the sheriff under the county manager's report? I think it's been a consensus item, but if okay, well, by consensus, we will we will do that. Thank you. All right, so we come to the consent agenda, and uh, Commissioner Belcher had a question um, or wanted a little bit of additional information yeah. on the small business um, item. So, yeah, I, ju I just think it's a it's a good thing that the board is is doing, and um, I thought it'd be good to pull it out where you could give it a little little explanation of it. Thank you. So, Chair and Commissioners, when you revised your economic development policy, you took some very decisive action. One, you said, appropriately under North Carolina General Statute, that any investment in economic development would come back before the board. Second thing, that it takes formal board action. The second thing you did was right-size that budget. So the budget was reduced to reflect only those commitments you'd already made to economic development, any new action, would, would require you all to allocate additional funds. At the same time, you, you made commitments to a $200,000 um, revolving loan for small and minority businesses and 250000 to support workforce development in early childhood education. The action tonight is to make those revolving multi-year funds. So if they're not all expended in a year, you're simply re 
refurbishing the pool back to 200,000 versus a new um, allocation every year. Okay, great, thank you. All right, if there's no other questions, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and follow the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, the next item up, I believe, is, a, is the public hearing on the TEFRA, the charter school financing item, and Mike Fru will present this uh, we'll present this item. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, this one's a, a little bit different from uh, hearings we've had in the past regarding uh, bond issuances. I think only one similar to this um, in the last 10 or 15 years. In this particular situation, uh, we have IC Imagine uh, Charter School here locally which is uh, planning to acquire property out in the county. And they're using the financing mechanism to have bonds and pay back those bonds. And it's sort of strange because they're using uh, uh, Wisconsin public authority and Wisconsin general statutes and also the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code requires that the local governing body of which the project is going to occur approve the project. So I see Imagine Charter School representatives um, we, two of which are here, Mia Strauss and Jen Townley, if you have any questions specific to the project, are requesting that the board approve the project. The important things for this board and for the community to understand is that no uh, faith and credit of uh, tax dollars are being obligated to pay for these bonds, and uh, you're not at all, the board is not at all assuring that it's a valid project or a good use of money at all. Um, it's a limited obligation bonds, uh, which means that it's just basically going to be a mortgage. I see Imagine is borrowing the money, then they're leasing it back to the school entity, and they're just asking to, the, this board approve the sale of the bonds through the Wisconsin statute and uh, authorize it. So it's just simply required to have a public hearing here, and that's what uh, I see Imagine is requesting. If you have any questions for Ms. Strauss or Ms. Townley, they're, I'm sure they're happy to pitch in. So I, I would like to just tell us a little bit about the school and what your where it's at and what you want to do. And sure, I'm Jen Townley. I'm the head of school. Um, the school will be located on the corner of McIntosh and Pond Road in Buncombe County. We are a K-12 charter school. We've been open for four years. We currently serve about 850 students, and when we're in our building, we'll serve 1,300 students in our community. Um, we are a public school, so we're funded publicly, but because we're a charter school, we're a nonprofit. Okay. Would you like to know more about the project itself? Or are you? Sure. Um, it'll be a 115,000 square foot building um, that includes a, a fine arts theater and a gymnasium for the students, along with classrooms for kindergarten through 12th grade on approximately 47 acres. Very nice. All right, I don't hear any other questions right now, so why don't we open the public hearing? And uh, so just, um, y'all can sit down, but if there's any questions, uh, stick around in case anybody has any other questions, okay? All right, so I will um, open the public hearing on this item. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment? We'll open the public hearing at 5.13. Are there, uh, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. You know, I love school. I, I, I passed kindergarten, so I made it pretty good. Uh, you need to lighten up up there. You don't look too good right now. <laughs> lighten up a little bit. Uh, my concern is a little different than just approving this thing because it's the first time that I recall this ever coming before a commission uh, on charter school on approval of a debt like this. Um, first of all, I'd like to know the general statutes and the numbers that goes with it. Uh, this is no small amount of money. So uh, when we're talking about the regular school system being uh, bricks and mortar, here we're going back to something else here at 
27, 28 million dollars, that's a lot of money. Uh, so I'm concerned about a bigger picture, not just today, and not just about this particular school, but this is a, uh, could be a snowball going down the road. If we start looking into these projects like this on a charter school, it's an extension of the public school. So uh, I'd like to know if this is going to be a trend that's going to be started today, because I've never seen it before a board before. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the implication of this going forward, uh, what the prospects are. Because serving kids, uh, we've been talking about the smaller class sizes and all kinds of things like that. And I'm not questioning how they're running the school. I'm questioning where is this going to take us as a county on the financing of these things on down the road. Is this something to get us in the gate and then obligate the county to resources down the road? Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, anyone else? All right, we'll close the public hearing at 5.15. Commissioners, is there a motion? Um, I just had a question. What, why is why is this um, through this course? Is it? I mean, as Mr. Rice said, you know, I don't think we've ever had something like this before. Yeah, like uh, I think I said, I, I remember one before, and it was the same Wisconsin authority and the Wisconsin statute, and so it might have been one for one of the volunteer fire departments. I think oh, they got right. the approval, and I think they ended up borrowing money in a different fashion. Uh, this is just a different way of borrowing money. It's just a, a less interest, better write-offs, uh, IRS reasons, taking advantage of IRS uh, rules and regulations. There's nothing at right. all wrong with it. They're just looking for the best rate they can. I understand that they're currently in the Kmart shopping center, so they're just making the big, bold leap to build out their, their dream school. And okay. it's, this is not an obligation of the county. It's not a debt of the county, and the county doesn't have to pay it back. And is this something you, Wisconsin does a lot? I mean. I do not know. They do. They do. Apparently they do. I guess, yeah, I've talked to a couple <coughs> lawyers, uh, and, and it's, it's just a mechanism that's available. I mean, the other, uh, another thing they possibly could have done, uh, might have been more difficult, would be the county's industrial facilities pollution control financing authority. Of course, we've come before you with a couple of those matters. Right. But it's just a, a different mechanism. I'm maybe this is for the private sector for a nonprofit. Maybe that's the preferred avenue. Thank Why you. do we go through Wisconsin? That's the st state and the statute. It's the public finance authority of the state of Wisconsin. The statutory references Mr. Rice is asking for are in the resolution attached to the agenda, uh, and it mentions the IRS code as well. Uh, I guess North Carolina just doesn't have that kind of mechanism. I think our industrial facilities authority would be an appropriate mechanism for uh, the Ingles or any other entity that wanted to borrow money on a bond type basis, but this is for nonprofits, so I think this is the mechanism available. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the same school that was going to buy the ferry road land three or four years ago? Apparently so. Oh, okay. The school right now, they're running the school over on Bavard Road at the mall where the Kmart's at. Yes, Kmart. it's got pretty big, so. Thanks. So I move approval. Unless we have more comments. I'll make a motion for it. Second. Okay, well, there you go. All, you right. Got three. <laughs> all right, we've got a motion and a second over here. Um, uh, thanks for all those questions. Uh, yeah. You know, it is, it is very unusual. It is. Um, it, it, it's a little hard to understand why this Wisconsin is financing, you know, this school in North Carolina. but. The bottom line for the county is that <coughs> there's no we're they're not we're not guaranteeing this loan. We have no financial stake in the outcome of uh, this financial Absolutely. transaction. It sounds like it sounds like the it. entity simply wants to make sure that the communities that they're located in don't have objections to the project itself, which I don't think anyone uh, does. So there's no financial risk to taxpayers or the county for approving uh, approving this. Correct. What happens if they default on the loan? Well, that's why they call them limited obligation bonds. The, 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 the holders of the bonds would have to go through a trustee. They'd have a trustee mechanism like some bank somewhere, and the remedy would be to foreclose. 
and they don't sign a separate note that I know of. That's why it's a limited obligation bond. So it's just the land is the security for the debt. It's the first time I've seen it through schools like this. Thanks. All right, we've got a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Good luck. Yeah. All right, uh, the next item on our agenda is the um, county manager's report. And I believe um, we're going to invite Sheriff Duncan to join us. Thank you again for being with us this evening to. Uh, speak to the commission and give us some updates from the sheriff's department good afternoon commissioners good afternoon. uh i appreciate you guys put me on the agenda i know it was kind of last minute and it was spurred on by some of the events from last week uh commissioner beach for our commissioner frost and commissioner whitesides uh released some proposals last week and that's what i'm here to talk about uh, a qualifying statement and some proposals uh i'll be honest with you i referred to it as a slap in the face uh, that was some pretty strong language, but that's really kind of what it felt like because it's hard for me not to refer to Jasmine, Al, and Ellen by their first names because I know them all very well and have had many conversations with them uh, outside this boardroom. So when I read the need for oversights for their sheriff's office and other law enforcement agencies in Buncombe County, I was kind of shocked. And I also looked at the statement, the preface of the statement, because uh, Commissioner Beach Farrar said it was a crisis of racial bias in the way people in Buncombe County were being policed that was on par with the opioid epidemic. And we have all been involved in trying to work on the opioid epidemic and the, and the tragedy that's brought to our community. And I just thought that was just really an overstatement. And then I started looking at the proposals. And the proposals one of them I'm all about. The second one I'm about with some funding from the commission, but it's not for the training. It's around how we're staffed for us to be able to do the training. And the third is a set of uh, oversight proposals that I am vehemently against. And if you'll give me a minute, I, and, and I hope today, it's really not a presentation. I'll, I hope this is the start of a conversation that continues on past today that we really pull some very positive things out of what started out of the rough. So um, let me talk about the things that I'm against and why. The proposals of oversight really talk about taking control of police department's policies from a review standpoint and bringing them up to a particular standard, President Obama's 21st century policing policies, which we do quite a bit of. Uh, and I would love at some point in time, we don't have enough time tonight to discuss it, but the way we engage with the community and get community input from them and how we go about handling their problems has been the way that we've done business for the past seven or eight years, and we've been recognized nationally for that. Um, I think some of you took uh, umbrance to the fact that I referred to it as an anti-law enforcement agenda. Now, I think nobody that's here in elected office doesn't realize the fact that there's a pretty strong anti-law enforcement activist crowd that generally is active in the city of Asheville. It's well funded, uh, it's well organized, and one of the things that they try to do is they try to put pressure on local boards and councils to give up law enforcement's ability to set their policies. And I'm going to give you a specific example, and it, and it really got pointed out to me today because the public defender, Leanne Melton, has sent out a memo about doing these things that Asheville's proposing. Two of them, which sounds reasonable if you don't work in law enforcement, are policies around regulatory stops of motor vehicles and consent searches. One says that law enforcement will be very well restricted in what kind of regulatory is dead tags, uh, tail lights out, equipment stops, those kind of things uh, on the motoring public, that they can't pull a motorist over for that, that they have to contact them through mail or some other reason. And uh, the reason why they try to push that is because some of the traffic study data that has come back to APD from uh, Ian Mance and Patrick Connick. Now, what I would say to that is, please don't do that. It sounds reasonable, but when we're right in the middle of an opioid crisis, 
If you call the sheriff's office or the police department and you say, I have somebody beside me that's selling heroin out of this house. I know they're doing it. We receive those calls every day. Or I know they're selling drugs out of this house. Vehicle stops and consent searches are two of the major tools we use to combat that to be able to find out, to be able to get a search warrant, to be able to go back and deal with that residence. Um, so, you know, as I've talked with some of my officers, if you take away our tools to keep the community safe, then who should folks call when they want a drug house in their community dealt with? Now, if you've not had that problem, good for you. But a lot of people in Buncombe County have because I do not exaggerate when I say I feel those calls every day I come to work. Um, should I tell them to call the commissioners that are now in control of the policy? Or the activist groups that have brought the pressure to get control of the policies? So that's why I kind of said no way with this. Uh, when I looked at it statutorily, the county commissioners have no statutory authority to dictate to the sheriff's office, and I'm not talking about me, uh, I'm gone in seven months. We can put it in the frame of the next sheriff that'll be here or any other sheriff in the 100 counties in North Carolina. They have no statutory authority to dictate to that sheriff what policies they will take, what law enforcement actions they will take. You guys have fiduciary responsibilities to approve budgets. Now that's the most negative thing I had to bring to you tonight, and I'm glad that's out of the way because I'd much rather talk about the opportunity for collaboration here. Uh, we are an agency of best practice and we train continually. Our biggest challenge to do our training is our staffing levels. Uh, Brownie, Joe, Mike, Robert, you guys, all y'all been to a community meeting at some point in time and, and I get asked from the community, why do you not have more deputies, Sheriff? You know, we generally have 13 or 14 that are out fielding your calls for service in a county at 656 square miles and 90% of that falls to us because we make it work and we've been able to make it work. We know when we come ask you for extra personnel, that's a hit on the tax base. And I feel very responsible to the people of Buncombe County to make sure that we don't ask for what we don't absolutely have to have. But what I'm gonna tell you is, as our population grows, we're gonna have to be staffed to some different levels. It won't be me asking. Uh, you've got all the ask out of me unless we decide to do something different you'll get before I'm done. But uh, what I will tell you is for us to train, the cost of training is not to hire the people to come in and do the training or pay for the training. It's the personnel cost associated with training. When you have an agency of 420 people to pull all those folks in and put them through a mandatory training, that's a huge expense. And one of the obstacles is with 12, 13, 14, 15 people. Now we've got 16 on a patrol shift with a lieutenant out here answering calls, but generally when you take that relief factor of six, sick time, training, vacation, and all that, what, we don't let them work with less than 12 and at least two supervisors on the road. So as you can see, we really push that minimal staffing level. So to be able to engage in a lot more training, which I would love to do, and I agree with you on that, we're gonna to have to be staffed at a different level. The cost won't be for training. A lot of times the, that's provided through the community college system. We can bring trainers in. They manage to get that paid for. The cost is personnel cost and having those relief factors in place. And I'm game. If you guys are game, I'm game. The next thing and the most positive thing I can bring to you is the establishment of a human relations council. When ABCRC was functioning, which is what we used to use as a human relations council, I travel with them to Charlotte and Fayetteville to see how their human relations councils worked. I traveled with Sarah Nunez, there were several of us that went. Uh, we took one of the sheriff's office's vehicles and went and met. Now you may say, Sheriff, why do you believe so strongly in that? Because when Sarah Nunez was over the ABCRC, she got policy change from your sheriff's office but it was done in the way it ought to be done. And let me tell you the story. We did a cops team, one of those things that we got recognized for for community policing in a Latino neighborhood. They asked us to come, we showed up. Our officers, when they go to Barnardsville, which they're there tonight, they're, they're out there right now doing a cops team, or when they go to any other area of the county, one of the things that they use is traffic checks to be able to find out who's coming in and out of the neighborhood. 
Well, understanding that you're operating in a Latino community with all the issues around driver's license and all the hardship that that brings and those things that that incur, we messed up. We did what we normally did, not to put a hardship on anybody. We just took our normal playbook and we went out there and we went to work. Sarah Nunez called me up and she said, Sheriff, what are you doing? I said, well, we're trying to help this community and she told me what we were doing and I said, and I got it immediately. I went back to the patrol division. I went back to Chief Deputy Rogers and I said, we need to dial in a directive and change that policy and look and make sure that we're sensitive to the folks that live in that particular community, how we go about policing. We still want to go there and help, but this has all different kinds of implications for that community that it doesn't have for other communities. I called Sarah back and I said, we fixed it. She said, that's not good enough. <laughs> she said, uh, she fireballed. And we, we have a great relationship because it came through producing a product for the community that was helpful. Uh, she said, I want to see that change in your policy. So I had Terry draw those directives up and we put it into our operational plan. I went and I met with that community and sat down with them and I said, I'm sorry, we messed up. Wasn't intentional. Here's what we've done to fix it. Please continue to work with us because they were getting their houses broke into. That's why we were there to begin with. That's what a human relations council can do for you. Jasmine, you and I have had this conversation many times. We've all got things that we're about. We've all got our whys in place that are important to us, that we're emotional about. I get all that. But when you come sit down with a group of people to collaborate on producing a product, if you're sitting there with law enforcement or somebody that you're, the folks that you normally work with are dead set against, if you're going to collaborate and produce a product, you have to advocate for those folks sitting at the table if they're doing it right. You call them out when they don't, but you advocate for them when they do it right. Uh, that's what I'm asking for. I got seven months left. That's a lot of time. Some days it seems like it'll never end. I've had one of those weeks last week. Y'all can laugh. I'm like, Jerry, y'all can laugh. We're okay. It's a conversation. Uh, seven months is a long time to get some things accomplished. I am more than happy to meet you and have this conversation about establishing Asheville and Buncombe County, a human relations council that's effective, that deals with the people that live in the neighborhoods, the complaints they have and the issues they have with law enforcement. And it's done in a factual based way that doesn't deal with national things, but deals with that neighborhood right here in Buncombe County that produces something tangible for the people that live in that community. I want to be a part of that. Um, you know, when you do those things, that's what makes hard days worth it. I can promise you that if we get together, we collaborate, we get that done, and we see what that brings to a community, it will be worth all the hardship that all of us lived through last week, and I hope we're able to get that done. You guys have any questions for me? I don't know if it's a question. <clears throat> but I thank you for what you do. Yes, sir. And I do think I've seen letters from Woodfin, <clears throat> Weaverville, that are not liking this either. We, as you said, we give you money when you ask for it. Yes, sir. We do not give you instructions what to do with your money. You're elected, no different than we are. This is not a board that should be trying to run a sheriff's department or run Woodfin Police Department or Weaverville or Black Mountain. Writing stuff down and put it in a paper before anybody knows it, I'm against. Doing, Van doing a Buncombe Asheville review, well that kind of, it's okay in its own way, but you know, bring Woodfin into it, the chief. Bring the chief from Black Mountain, the chief from Weaverville. That's the people that need to make it work. It's not any of us sitting on this board. I promise you that. Because I could build a race motor, but I'm not a police officer. And that's the way, way I look at it. I got elected to, to try to distribute the taxpayers' money in the best way I can. Giving you the money to do what you want to do with. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes I disagree. But I do support where you're at. I do not support what was put in the paper, period, <clears throat> at all. 
I'm sorry that this gentleman, Mr. Rush, what happened to him? 100% sorry. And I don't care what color he is. If it's a white guy, it would bother me just as bad. Totally. But it's not for us to make decisions for what you do. That's, so that, I'm, Commissioner Fry, this would be my hope. Um, you know, to say what a, a human relations council is and pose it and say Weaverville Wood from Black Mountain, Biltmore Forest, y'all going to be part of this thing without letting them experience it like I have, experientially what good it can do. Uh, I, I don't know that they would be clamoring, and they might be. I don't know. I'm, I'm glad to have that conversation, conversation with them. But I do know this. I think if we have that entity functioning, and it sees how it works for both, well, for all the people sitting at the table. And, and when we get into underserved communities, we get into the issues, it's not just law enforcement. There's a lot of things that contribute. Uh, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of underserved communities in Buncombe County, but they're not primarily African-American. They're Latino and they're Caucasian, but a lot of the factors are still at the table. Uh, so what it does is it brings those stakeholders to the table to have open discussions around outcomes, not around positions, not around agendas, but around outcomes and what you produce. And I, and I think it can be a very effective way. And when these municipalities see this work, I think they'll want to be part. I don't think you'll have to convince. So that would be my plan where but we would start. The, in the municipalities, I understand that they're not happy. And I saw 30 years they haven't had not one problem in <laughs> Weaverville, right. you know. Uh, so. You know, we're, we're trying to put a blanket on something that shouldn't have a blanket on it. You know, the city of Asheville has a problem. They have for a long time. It's not the chief's fault. There's been a problem. Keeping officers. I remember when annexation was going on in the city of Asheville, and one night there's annex and all the way to airport road, and they said it's going to take three more officers. I looked at it, and I said, Joe Dunn's sitting up there, and I said, well, how are you going to get three more officers when you're 23 short already? So they were, at that time, trying to put more officers on. I don't know what they're trying to do today. But back then, and that's the way it was. And I know it's tough. And it's tough on the officers in the city. It's tough on all these officers. You know, some, I don't understand sometimes why any of you want the job. Because sometimes it's a miserable job. And, but uh, I appreciate everything all of you do from the cities, to every sheriff that's in here, the ones that protect us in here all the time. I just thank you. I, I have nothing else to say except the fact is, is what was done was wrong. I agree with you. And that's, that's, that's the worst thing. We had a, a deal a long time ago that was bad. This turned out to be worse. Any other questions I can take from the commissioners? Yeah. Uh, then, you know, since I'm one of the ones who signed on that. I feel that I've got to speak up. And, you know, we've known each other a long time. And I appreciate what you do, and I've supported you for 12 years. You know that. And I support the police officers. But what we did last week, I question if it was wrong. And the reason I say that is, you know, I have one fault, and that is that I care about people. I care about everybody. <clears throat> And sometimes what uh, we were concerned about, I think I speak for the other two commissioners, we didn't want us to end up in the same place that the city of Asheville's in. Folks, I've lived in this county for 73 years now. <laughs> I've known people in every nook and cranny from uh, Broad River to Sandy Mush because I worked with a lot of them through the bank. But what we're concerned about and wanted us to get to this point where we are now so that we can talk about it and stay ahead of the game because we don't want to end up where they are in Asheville. And look, I live in the city of Asheville, and I know. I've been profiled. I've been stopped in Asheville. So I know what the problem is there. But we want to make sure in doing our fiduciary responsibility as county commissioners that in representing the people who we represent that we don't get to that point. Yes, sir. And I would like to say I've heard from people too, although I guess a lot of my people that I hear from probably live in the city where it's just been the opposite. You know, they support what we're doing. But in any 
situation like this, we're going to have both. And I've heard from people everywhere. But I agree with you. We need to sit down and talk about it and go there. And I just caution you. I sit on the committee to help the city of Asheville with this new Human Relations Council bring it about. But in doing that, I just hope that we don't make the same mistakes that we made that killed the last Human Relations Council. And you're familiar with that, so I don't have to tell you. But I do think that's the way to go and we need to discuss it because that can handle a lot and prevent a lot of what we've gone through. Commissioner Whitesides, I've known you a long time and I absolutely give you the benefit of the doubt that your intentions were good. I think where we ran afoul with this thing is, you know, and I responded how I responded, I think where we ran afoul was the process and how, it, how the conversation started. But that doesn't mean that it can fail because the conversation started in a bad place. I'm still open to working on the training piece and absolutely open to the, in whatever way that the county can help with that. I, I, I would warn, it's going to be the structure of the Human Relations Council and who you put on that. <coughs> You can't have folks that are agenda driven. You have to have folks that are problem solving and looking out for the good of everybody and in this community. And uh, if, if, if we can get that achieved, I think what we'll see come out of it will be tremendous. Well, you know what some of us are looking at when it comes to the Human Relations Council, maybe we'll do, won't need to do our own in the county. You know, I'm not sure that we want to do it together. You know, we need to look at that. We And we may. I know a lot of times it gets to who's going to do the work. Mandy knows this. It's the fair housing. You know, there's a whole lot that they handle that's outside of law enforcement, and then it's how right. do you divide that up, and the jurisdictional boundaries get uh, sometimes to be an obstacle. So a lot of times if you can do that, that, that would be collaborative for the county and the city, that would probably be the best the best model to do, but I understand where you're coming from. So I think us doing something's better than That's nothing. right and staying in these unproductive battles. I, I'd much rather do something <coughs> to work towards a solution. Um, any other commissioners have any questions or comments at this time? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got <coughs> a couple comments. Uh, one is I, I want to I thank you for coming in uh, this evening. I think it's the, you know, the best way to, to promote a dialogue is to come in and address the situation, what you uh, uh, agreed with what you disagreed disagreed with um, I um, um, I was not asked to join in on the statement I did not join in on on, on the statement and and would not have for a couple reasons one is um, though I there are times from a budget standpoint that I will that I don't agree with the with the sheriff's department where we might look at something or we might try to refine something or have some other ideas uh, I, uh, I, and I and I think every commissioner understands this. I think that you know I, I understand through uh, my community uh, and through uh, some some young young uh, men and women that I know that are on the that serve that it's a very very difficult job. And I know you all are not looking for any pats on the back or anything like that. And I'm not I'm not I'm not doing that. I'm just acknowledging that it's, um, it, it is a very difficult position. Also, when you get out in the county, as you had mentioned before, uh, some of the underserved areas, are the, it's, it's different and how those, uh, those, uh, those areas are managed and, and how the relationships are built, you know, may be different. I, I know that in two of my communities, Lester and, and, and Candler, that, that, are, that, that have had challenges, y'all have uh, went out of your way with the cops team and some other things to try to bring those communities together so um, I don't I'm not looking for tonight to be a uh, an, an opportunity to pick pick sides because I don't think that's what we're here to do I don't think that's what you're here to do sure. um, I just want to acknowledge that I that I appreciate what you do I, I'm concerned about um, you know and and I, I don't have the facts but I'm, I'm concerned in some of the with some of the national things um, uh, about about our school school safety you know I want us to be uh, you know I've had some conversations about that you know and looking forward I'm not saying that we're doing a, a, a bad job it's just in light of events we get concerned in certain areas I'm concerned in that and always willing to uh, to step up with with any additional training that you know that is needed, I think that's always good. You know, if if uh, 
if it if it fits within the framework of what the sheriff's department is wanting to try to achieve and the end results in those communities so uh, but I want to thank all of you for coming out you've got quite a few here and um, in the men and women in, in blue and I appreciate appreciate what you do but my, I really appreciate the dialogue you, you didn't have to come in here tonight and and have this conversation that will open up a dialogue that I believe will produce some positive results and I, I thank you for doing that sure. I um <clears throat> Jasmine and Al and I wrote that with the best of intentions. Um, we've known each other a really, really long time. And you know how long before I was on the commission how I've always advocated for increases in salaries for law enforcement, public safety. Um, I've probably been the staunchest one for increased pay and increased pay and training. And, I, and I, I think this is a good conversation. I think um, what is emblematic about the problem we have in our community is that people feel a need to take sides when we're all in this together. Um, I grew up in an era where um, I was fortunate enough where a policeman was my best friend and I knew if I was in trouble, that's where I would go. That, that was fortunate for me and I was privileged to feel that way. There are a lot of in our community um, through no fault of anyone's that don't feel that way. And um, we have victims. Um, I know people um, who've been severely profiled, whether they're in the county or the city, um, but we can't get anywhere unless we have honest conversations. I've been an advocate for more funds for training for almost as long as we've known each other and increased officer pay. Um, N none of us would trade places with someone doing what you folks do. We would not. But the divide and the stark reaction, um, I think, is why we need to have a conversation because we're all in this together and we all have to be in this together. But um, we meant no intent. We did not mean to be insulting. We wanted to speak for a lot of the people that don't have a voice and there are a lot of them out there that feel underserved they're white they're brown whatever color they are but that's who I was speaking for I don't want to speak for the other commissioners but I go at this with a good heart I value and I respect what you all do um, as Commissioner Fryer said you know your dedication is endless but you know I think we have to look at our the whole county and advocate for everybody law enforcement and citizens so i thank you for being here and i hope this is a good start and i'll uh chime in and say i think this is an important conversation to be having uh and in my mind part of a long-standing conversation that we've been in and i've had opportunity to be in with other leaders in law enforcement it's a conversation i'll have with anybody any day uh, and i don't presuppose that we need to gr agree on every point in fact i think that having people who don't agree on every point often leads you to the best solutions. There's a tendency, I think, when something happens in one jurisdiction to say it's confined to that jurisdiction and we shouldn't talk about it. Uh, the intent of this statement was not to cast blame. It was not to paint with broad brush strokes. It was to talk about things that uh, have directly impacted constituents, community members in Buncombe County, and to put some policy ideas on the table. Maybe those are policy ideas that, you know, there's certainly ideas we need to kick the tires on. There may be ones where there's opportunity to move swiftly. My hope is and my belief is there are other ideas out there. Maybe they'll come from law enforcement. Maybe they'll come from the public defender or DA's office, from county or city staff, from community members and advocates. I'm a minister by training. I know a lot of clergy who work directly around these issues and also bring ideas to the table. I had the opportunity to be part of a community working group that APD convened to work on uh, the assessment and revision of use and force and de-escalation policies and I know that Asheville Police Department has some of the most forward-facing policies in the country around those. I think what happened with Mr. Rush helps us as a community see that policy is one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot of other pieces that have to come into play. Sure. It is my understanding that part of our role as a commissioner is to be putting policy ideas forward and talking directly with community members and having open doors that we don't need to agree at every time. 
Uh, but the intent of putting policy ideas out in a public setting is saying, these are ideas. Let's talk about them. Let's see where this process can get us. Uh, the intent is not to critique. The intent is not to overgeneralize. Um, but I know directly from hearing the stories and experiences of people in our community that whether an incident has happened within the jurisdiction one lives in or not, it can still touch you and inflect and impact the way that you experience local government, public offices and agencies, and interactions with law enforcement. Um, I think some communities in our country have to find a way forward. And you know, w this is a local issue, but we can't ignore what's also happening in the nation. New York City has some of the most, uh, you know, some of the most robust funding around these issues, and we saw just last week there was a shooting that happened, a tragic incident around a mental health incident that left a community member dead. It's every community in the country is facing questions like this. My focus and my orientation is how in Buncombe County we can come together across honestly divides that typically people keep people from talking. If people are going to get angry at me in that process, that's okay. I can take it. Um, I hope that I can always have the opportunity to clarify what my intention was. The intention here was not to criticize. The intention here was to put some ideas on the table and say, what can we do together as a community? And I truly believe in my heart, and my faith teaches me this each and every day. We have to be able to say in the same sentence, there are dedicated public servants and law enforcement who get up each and every day, and they're brave and they're courageous, and they serve our community in ways we don't always even understand. And there are members of our community, particularly those who are black and brown, who have learned to be afraid of interactions with law enforcement and who are scared about whether their children would be safe in those interactions. All of that's true. Part of our responsibility is to figure out how to have that conversation, not be scared of it, not run away from it, and be willing in this case, and I think this is part of what we were signaling, was saying we're ready, I'm ready to vote for funding around precisely these issues. The one final thing I'll say is I understand that there is concern about overreach. I don't see it that way. I respect the authority and autonomy of the Sheriff's Department to set policy at that level, and I understand the clear, bright lines that exist around our role. At the same time, one of the things that I take from the situation that happened in Asheville is there weren't enough mechanisms in our community for someone to report a use of, incident, use of force incident have access to victim services, and have access to information about what legal representation they were afforded and support in moving through that legal process. I imagine if one was a, uh, a victim of such an incident, it would be very intimidating and bewildering to try to figure out where to access support and assistance. Um, I don't know that that, figuring out how to address that, falls within the domain solely of the Sheriff's Department. I believe Sheriff's Department can be an important partner in that. But it might be that other agencies have a role to play in that as well. And of course, we come up against the statutory guidelines around access to use to body cam footage. Absolutely understand that. That's a question I would ask for legal advice on. But I do want to hold up one specific piece here, which is that I firmly believe that it will require many different agencies collaborating, having protocols around notification in these instances, communicating clearly, making sure that if officers are sworn into more than one department, there's notification and awareness of that, and making sure that community members know exactly what resources and support exist for them. So I want to make sure I'm being clear on that point and responding directly to the concern you've raised tonight and in other settings about overreach. Chairman, I was done, but now I'm not, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, you keep on referring to it as the sheriff's department. It's a sheriff's office. It has an elected official that is responsible for the outcomes of the actions of that office. That happens to be me. It will be for seven more months, and then it will be somebody else. There's a big difference in a department and an office. The police department reports to the elected council of the city, and they have oversight and some things that they're able to do. So I think really and truthfully, understanding the statutes and understanding the parameters of what you're dealing with is the first part of being able to collaborate because I would never dream of getting out of my lane in your statutory responsibility. Now, let me finish with this statement, and I say this for these people here in blue and black that serve. When elected officials jump on board with something that's very loosely grounded in fact, and they make people in the community feel like they have something to fear from people who are there to help them, you're adding to the problem. We had a situation at McDonald's yesterday. We went in to serve a warrant. 
we have traditionally never had race issues with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office, and it's not because we're just so much a better agency than the Asheville Police Department. We do not police that dynamic out in the county, okay? But we went in to serve a warrant, and a young African-American male who worked there crawled out the drive through window, ran, and was screaming, are you guys gonna murder me? That's what happens when you have these type of conversations to push political agendas. The day-to-day -day work they do out here gets complicated and it makes it harder and it makes it more dangerous for the people we serve and the people delivering the service. I've said enough. Chairman, thank you. I wanna appreciate the municipal chiefs for being here. I thank them for coming to support and I appreciate you hearing me. Still open to the collaboration. So I've got, you go ahead, because okay. you've not spoke, but I have one okay. other comment. Sheriff, I just want to say thank you for what you do and of what I support you. And it, it's a very tough situation, that what we went through, and it's communication. But for you to come here on the short notice that it was and present this to all of us, I think we all appreciate it, that we learned something today that or I know I'm, no, I'm speaking for myself because I can't speak for everybody. You have taught me a lesson today of the way you've done it, of vocally telling us in person instead of using Facebook and multimedia to have an argument. And I just want to tell you, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I also want to mention something. You know, I've, I've been a commissioner for, for almost six years. And I'll just say there's a there's a uh, there's a difference between uh, advocacy and service, um, and at the national level, there's a there, there's a lot of agendas that are being pushed by the media and pushed by different other things. You can you can believe them or not believe them or or accept them or you can you can stir them or or not. But it is a fact, and I am a Buncombe County Commissioner. I am driven by what occurs in Buncombe County. And that is what I will, will vote on. That is what I will fund. I am not gonna be moved by national agendas. I'm not gonna get caught up in all of that. Uh, it's too hard to deal with just what we've got to deal with. Other than, and, and I think that it's, it may, may be harder, and I can't speak for any commissioner, but when I become a commissioner, I thought there were some things that I could do. I learned very quickly, I couldn't do those because number one it wasn't my job number two statutorily i couldn't do it number three some people were elected in the in those positions i had some very very uh differences of opinions with the uh register of deeds uh and but that that position's elected your position is elected i fund and vote on your budget there and i will say again there is a difference between advocacy and there's a place for that. Uh, I have a, a lot of people that wonder why I don't stand on the, on the street and hold up signs for certain things. I have chosen after being a commissioner to not do that because for me it is very important to protect the integrity of this seat and stay within the decisions that I am called to do which end up on this agenda. If I have the ability to get them on the agenda, then we will vote on them. And there is a difference between structures, between different, um, I mean, you go, to, you go to Nashville and they, they, don't, they don't have the city county government, they have one government. There's differences in, in how these things are handled. But I, you know, I think collaboration is what we need. Um, and and y'all know, if I wanted to right now, everybody, everybody knows enough about, about me, I'd, I, I'd, I, could, I could break into scripture and start preaching to you because that's who I am, and I would love to do that. As a matter of fact, I, I might as well tell you about the Christ I serve, and I love the opportunity from a compassionate heart to try to do this job, and that's what we have to do out in this community, is have compassion in these underserved areas. I have, I have seen evidence of that from your department, and I know it's a difficult job, but I will say here tonight, there's a big difference between advocacy in service and those lines can get blurred and we have to be careful as commissioners not get caught up in national things be focused on what we have here 
and we may be influenced by them, but Buncombe County is hard enough to do. Uh, it, ju it just is. And uh, as a commissioner, it's very, very difficult to stay within the scope of what we do. It's a, it's a very big, very big job. For all, with all due respect to everyone, yep. my feelings about this, my desire for more training, my more advocacy for constituents has nothing to do with a national agenda or a political agenda. It is for what's fair and right to represent citizens that I represent when I hear their stories, when I hear folks talk about being afraid to go to certain areas, that's who I represent. This has nothing to do with politics on a national level. This is to represent the people that matter to me. And when I hear stories, I also have evidenced this department's compassion and kindness. This is not meant to divide, but when someone says that my words are from a national agenda, no, it's from my heart and it's from people that I love and that are close to me. And you know, one final thing I would like to say, unfortunately in this country, and I've seen it, the county, the city, whatever, when we have conversations like we're having tonight, and it all comes down to race in one way or another, they're painful but we've got to have them if we're going to get where we need to be. Thanks, I'm through. And I, I have one more, then I'm done. All right. I don't want it to come down to race because it's like I talked to Al and talked to the city council members downstairs. Many years ago, both of us above 70, he was on one side of the track and I was on the other side of the track. We both called each other names. I was the honky, okay? Al knows basically where he was at. We finally got to the middle of the tracks. All this is today is moving us away from the center of the tracks. Racism is not something. I don't look in this audience and see color anymore. I don't, and I won't. That's a fact. But your job is your job. Our job is to give you money. It's not to control you. I promise you. And what they did was wrong. I understand Al's side of it because the community, but I understand my side of it because I talk to people too. And it's not anything to do with the, the main government. The fact is, as I look out here and I see a lot of people that really want to work hard for the people of the county, the city, all the cities, and I'm, I'm proud of them. But I'm not proud that we have people that want to say, well, we're going to give you some more money to do funding for this or that. I didn't know that. It was three people that made a decision that they was going to try to do something that nobody else knew about, us or you. And I appreciate you coming in. I appreciate every one of you that walked in here, the chiefs from the different areas. But I am... As long, I will be voting no on anything that they try to bring forward that tries to govern the Sheriff's Department. I promise you. I can say no to your budget, but I can't say no to what you try to do after that. All right, so, uh, Sheriff, thank you for coming in this evening. Thank you to all the law enforcement men and women who are here. Thank you for your service to our community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, I, you know, and I appreciate all the commissioners. Um, I. I figured this might not be might not be a simple informational presentation. Um, you know, these are these are important issues in the community, of course, and so, and people feel very strongly about them. Um, public safety is is one of our most important roles of government, and your office is is uh, is critical to that. As are all the municipal agencies uh, in our community, uh, as has been said before, it's it's one of the hardest jobs that exists in our community, and. Um, so uh, we appreciate it, um, but the uh, issues around uh, community concerns and civil liberties are very important to people too. So these are, these are not easy conversations. Um, I think there is a lot of common ground. We've already ta talked about some of it this evening. Uh, and as has been said before, it's, it's okay to, to not agree on every single policy point that comes up. If we, if we did, we probably, probably means we're not asking hard enough questions, right? right. And, um, so, um, but I think this was a good, a good part of advancing the conversation and we look forward to, to continuing that with you and all the other folks uh, in the law enforcement community. 
So thank you. Thank you. Him. All right. <clears throat> okay. The um, <clears throat> next item on the agenda uh, is uh, going to be introduced by County Manager Mandy Stone. Chairman and Commissioners, we bring to you tonight as a staff updated administrative policy, specifically a countywide policy related to gift cards, meals, and meetings. While we did have policies in health and human services in those areas, tonight we bring you a countywide policy. In addition, we bring you revisions to the procurement card policy and our travel policies. I do want to begin by saying that it's not that there were no rules or policies in place. It's that the highest ranking county employee chose to act outside those policies and rules. It's not that, that anywhere in those policies it, it gave authority to the highest acting county employee to act outside of them. What's different today is this board took quick and decisive action to limit the chief executive officer's opportunity to, to implode any kind of management override against policies. And I want to talk about that because that happened July 1st. As of July 1st, the county manager was limited both in the amount of expenditures and the way in which the county manager can expend funds. It established the finance director as a secondary approver on any expenditures the county manager made. It required that any changes to a budget ordinance or personnel ordinance be published ahead of time, hold a public hearing, and that the majority of the board vote on those changes. Replace anywhere in our budget or personnel ordinance the chair having discretion and made clear that any action required a public vote by the majority of the board. It, it also included changes in the reporting structure to our internal auditor and our audit committee. We've also added additional resources to internal audit. It changed the reporting structure of the finance director and segregated the duties of the finance director and the chief executive officer. I, I want to share that to make the point that the policies we bring you tonight are good governance. They're just simply updating policies and making decisions that move us forward as an organization in the right way. You dealt immediately in July and again in August with the crisis issues that faced us as an organization, and that's not what we bring you tonight. The, the policies we bring you tonight were developed by staff, many of whom are here tonight and two of, two of whom will present them. When you adopted COSO internal audit standards, that requires you to say that internal audit has to be integrated throughout the organization, that every employee has a responsibility to make sure we manage the public resources correctly and that we have an avenue to raise questions or concerns when we see something that doesn't appear right. You took decisive action to do that. I think that's important and to remind yourself you have almost 1,500 employees who act with integrity and manage the public's resources from a place of honesty and responsibility, and that's what we bring to you tonight. When you adopted the COSO standards, you took additional steps. You established a no retaliation policy. You gave employees a way to voice concerns and not fear that there would be consequences as related as a, a, in relation to that. You developed an employee protection hotline and you added structure to your whistleblower hotline that removed any oversight from the county manager's office. These policies that we bring you tonight have been benchmarked across counties in North Carolina. We feel like they represent best practice. And I also want to make the point that we bring them to you tonight aligned with our implementation of Workday, our new financial and human capital system. County has been implementing that system ready to launch for the last three years and we launched April 1st. That system, and you'll hear about that tonight, brings you in automatic approvals into the system and it also provides the opportunity for increased public transparency 
including an online checkbook system so the public can see how, how the county expands its resources. Tonight, um, I want to thank Jim Holland, who's the Assistant County Manager, and Terry Orange, our internal auditor, who oversaw several um, staff work groups from large county departments, small county departments, from finance and budget. We really want these to be policies that are functional and work in the day-to-day -day operations of the county. John Hudson and Dustin Clark have led the work group that revised the policies you're going to see tonight, and they're here to talk you through them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members for this opportunity, and uh, thank you to Mandy and Jim and Terry for uh, their leadership through this process. Uh, we've got a presentation for you uh, that we'll walk through. The goal of the presentation tonight is uh, not only to give you some specific updates on, on certain policies that we're going to walk through, but also to give you a glimpse into the administrative inner workings of your county management and show you some of the things that have been going on. Uh, so to take a step back, and look at just a few of the things that have happened recently since uh, uh, County Manager Stone came into her position. Uh, definitely not a comprehensive list, but uh, there was an internal audit reorganization that's really driven a lot of the work that we've done. Uh, so that function was reorganized to suit best practices. Uh, there was also uh, an assessment and update to the personnel ordinance, uh, which you all adopted back in October uh, as uh, Mandy mentioned the workday implementation has been a huge uh, focus, especially in our area. Uh, and this really does change the way that we literally do every financial transaction in the county. Uh, everything is routed electronically. The auditability of the system really focuses less on people and more on roles. Uh, and so that broadens up uh, everything within the system to a much larger audience. Uh, and it also enables us to, to really approach transparency in a new way. And so I know one of Tim's initiatives that we're planning on for the summer would be that open checkbook that Mandy mentioned. Uh, and so lastly, there's a fiscal accountability framework that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, and we're going to drill in here to that. This is a structure that Mandy presented. Um, so a lot of the administrative work we're going to talk about is just part of county government. Uh, but Mandy, when she came in, uh, she presented this framework which formalized a lot of the processes uh, in within the organization it also brought together some cross-functional teams to pursue these areas so three main areas uh, the first one is the one we're going to focus on for the rest of the presentation that's the policies and procedures area uh, so there were some some uh, key policies that were pointed out for us to address there also uh, was the desire for us to formalize the approach that we took to reviewing county policies so write it down prioritize uh, and determine what the roles and scopes are in that process. And we'll drill into that in a little bit. Uh, next up was a structure group, and this is led, uh, so John and I aren't, aren't a part of that, but they're evaluating just the structures within the organization across staffing, reporting, and, and so forth, uh, some best practices in that regard. Uh, and they're also tackling uh, a point that Joe has mentioned a few times, the gatekeeper function. They're taking kind of a tiered approach to that. So as Mandy mentioned with COSO, every individual in the organization has responsibility to play a role there, but also at each level uh, there are opportunities that we can define and take advantage of. And then lastly, uh, the organizational culture and, and public transparency are, are huge topics that we really want to take a formal approach to, to pursuing and improving. And these are just, the, all three of these areas are things that will continue uh, as part of just the inner workings of county admin uh, from, from here forward. So I'll let John speak to this. Good evening. So as we move forward with the policies and procedures, our team <coughs> looked at an inventory of the current policies we had. And then we also looked at peer counties, other urban counties policies, other, other organizations on a par with that made sense to look at those policies and inform what we were doing. And we esta then established a process for our policy assessment. We recommended a priorities for our policy reviews, and we looked, we looked at our policies, and we decided what was good, what might need to change, where our str strengths were, and what we and what we needed to add to those policies. And then we have 
a vast amount of different departments and that vary wildly in scope and size. So we had to address unique and unusual department needs. And, and I think what drove our process <clears throat> was to have policies that were that everyone could understand and, and didn't restrict people's ability to do their jobs. Some, rather than make it too restrictive, make it easy to read, plain language, and, and that it was viable and that it wasn't, and that those policies were useful to people and not something that people were going to throw away. Uh, we wanted things to be clear and concise. I think you can say something in three pages a lot easier sometimes than you can in nine or ten. And people are going to read a three-page policy before they're going to read a ten or fifteen-page policy. So then we produced updated financial policies based on that process. So we had 15 members in our policy work group. We had 10 departments directly represented. I'd like to recognize some of our folks, if they'd stand up and, and be recognized briefly, who participated on our team. Maybe they don't want to stand up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're here. Um, we have Matt Evans and Autumn Livers from Budget and, and Finance. We have Tessa Downey. We have Ron Venturella from procurement here with us. And uh, Sherry Powers with the Sheriff's Office was here earlier this evening as well. So thank you very much, folks. Um, this was a fantastic team that really pulled together and, and gave us deliverables in a very short amount of time. We convened this group at the very beginning of February and delivered these policies for review to Ms. Stone's management team by the end of that month. So the policy lineup, we worked through the first four policies on this list, the procurement cards or the P cards, the gift card policy, our travel policy, and our meeting and meal expenses were the things that we addressed initially in this round. Our work is not done and we have other policies on this list as you can see that we'll be working on over the next several weeks. So I'd like to talk just briefly about the, the criteria that the group used. So what, what were the things we were looking for when we went through these policies? First of all, clarity. Was this something that was the state, the purpose was clearly defined? Do, do you understand what's going on when you read, read the policy? Um, effectiveness. So now that we have that objective stated, does the policy as written achieve that objective? Uh, risk management was definitely important. Are, are those organizational risks mitigated? Uh, and those can be impropriety. They, they can also be cost inefficiency or inequities. Um, but balancing that with risk operation or impact operations was also a focus and because of this cross-functional uh, group we're able to to hear different uh, perspectives from across the county something that may seem relatively straightforward on on one side of the county may actually impact operations on on another so uh, definitely great to have those perspectives there um, and then also comparison to peers so we started this process by doing our homework looking at other counties seeing what what changes there have been out out in the field um, and, and using those to inform our decisions. Uh, so just some conclusions. Um, you know, this, this cross-functional group did come together uh, to review the P-card and travel policies in particular. Uh, those policies have, are always being uh, looked at and considered and assessed. You know, every year we picked up an existing policy that was already undergoing an assessment process for our review. Uh, and what we discovered is looking at, at benchmarks with other peers, uh, the policies in place covered the major controls and risk areas uh, fairly well. Um, however, there were some updates that needed to be made. Uh, start for starters, there was a lot of old references to legacy systems. As I mentioned, we had a pretty decent sized system implementation going into effect, so just simply updating that language is part of the process. However, uh, we did find some areas for improvement based on our new management expectations, and so we wanted to address those. Uh, and the process we used were taking those recommendations, presenting them out to the management team uh, countywide, to dr directors and departments, trying to gather their feedback uh, and processing it through the review team and, and tweak, making tweaks based on that. Uh, so 
we'll dive into the policies now. Uh, <coughs> we'll start off with me, uh, me, meals and meetings. The uh, meals and meetings policy was not a policy that existed at the county level prior. Um, Health and Human Services developed a policy under the direction of Jim Holland when he worked for Health and Human Services as the, um, as the Health and Human Services Support Team Director. And so we looked, he, he tasked us with looking at what we're spending on food and how we're doing it and, and when we should be doing it and why we should be doing it. So we looked, we pulled that policy back out, we revised and we recommended it for, for the county. The new policy establishes guidelines for appropriate events and activities. Um, examples of those things, it is not a comprehensive list, but it includes meetings of the board, the, the advisor, advisory committees, public officials, and community members in supporting and collaborating in our program successes, trainings, workshops, webinars, and seminars, and meetings with community members regarding collaboration and partnership in the community. It also establishes requirements for documentation of these events and outlines unacceptable uses and events. The travel policy was, um, had last been touched in 2012 with some minor revisions, but really hadn't been looked at in almost 10 years. So there were a lot of outdated things related to travel. We, we travel very differently than we did 10 years ago. Um, so we did make a lot, of, a lot of changes around the world we're living in now and how we book travel, how we, how we travel. We looked at our per diem meal allowances and incidental expenses and what lodging and transportation looks like now and, and built parameters around that. We have requirements for approval of foreign travel. We uh, looked at local mileage for county business. We also built in at the request of the county manager um, specifics or about the, count, the travel of the county manager, the assistant county manager, and the CFO, and how that reporting needs to come to the, to the Board of Commissioners. General administrative cleanup, we removed outdated references to our legacy Lawson system and we removed hard-coded numbers that have changed over time. The uh, GSA rates for set by the federal government evolve on an annual basis. We had a 120 mile per day rule removed, which seemed somewhat arbitrary. And again, like I said, the approval of notice is required for the travel by Board of Commissioners. We really wanted, like, our, like we said earlier, our guiding principle was to allow departments to do what they need to do with, and let them let department man, managers make their own decisions and how to, they have their own budgets, they have their own needs without getting in the way of what they need to do, but still set parameters that, every, that make sense and, and are good business sense and good for the county. Moving into the procurement card policy, this is definitely a major one. Uh, this is a program that has a lot of benefit to the county, but also has some risk, and so it requires a, a pretty comprehensive policy. Uh, the, the purpose of this policy is to provide guidelines for the use and administration of that program and set some controls as, and measures as well to help with those risks. So the, the big points are, you know, how does a, a procurement card get requested? What are the training requirements, terms and conditions, and reporting structures? Uh, purchasing guidelines, what's an acceptable and unacceptable use of that card, as well as penalties for misuse. Uh, some of the changes that we recommended after review, along with just administrative cleanup, uh, we also defined some of the roles and responsibilities a little bit more cleanly. Um, we added some tiers for monthly limits, so as opposed to one limit being used for everyone by default, uh, that may be a little bit more than is necessary for some use cases, we wanted to set some tiers for that. Uh, we required some written requests for increases to those limits, which we found to be a best practice when looking at peer policies. Uh, we increased the training requirements, uh, so it, there's now a, a recurring training requirement where there was not one before. Um, there was an inactivity clause added, so if you don't use the card for a certain period of time, that card will become inactivated. Uh, we also added some reporting requirements around 
uh, cards that are issued to appointed employees by the board as well as the Board of Commissioners. Uh, I think our open checkbook initiative will actually cover this very well, so it will go above and beyond the policy, but we did want to put that in there. Uh, and then lastly, there are some pre-audit requirements specifically defined by the Local Government Commission's guidance, which uh, we wanted to add in there as well. Uh, and lastly, but not least, uh, we adopted a countywide gift card policy. Uh, and so the purpose of this policy was to establish a policy for minimizing or eliminating the risks that are known to be associated with gift cards, <laughs> while also trying to maintain the program uh, requirements that we found. Uh, some of the major points were, you know, off the bat, there wasn't an existing policy outside of HHS that specifically talked about gift cards. So we found that to be uh, a bit of a gap. Uh, procurement card policy was amended to exclude using those for gift cards at all. Um, there was a specific policy created which followed that HHS example as well as some other county peers which have started to do this. Uh, gift cards are not to be purchased or given to any employee in the county uh, and that is a change. I think there was some uh, historically some employee appreciation cases that existed. Those are now gone. Um, no gift cards are to be used for payment for goods or services uh, and then we did look at eliminating gift cards entirely for the county uh, and that is still something that's actively under consideration. However, uh, what we found were there were some use cases that have uh, legitimate purposes that is difficult for us in our role to say should go away. Uh, so what we did was we adopted a procedure where any gift cards that are be, to be procured have to be procured centrally through a gift card liaison. This is an approach that we saw in peer counties as well. So that's, that makes it very simple. If it's happening outside of this one lane, then it's, it's not okay. Um, and then we limited the use specifically to the four areas that we identified. So Health and Human Services has uh, a use case for family, family preservation uh, and, and some other cases there. I think they're, all, all the parties involved are evaluating to say, do we really need to use this as an avenue? Uh, and that's something that we'll continue to evaluate moving forward. Uh, Soil and Water has some, uh, a use case using grant funds for uh, some educational awards, so not county dollars there. Um, sustainability also has some grant funded use cases that our gift cards are an incentive for folks who to participate in the programs. Um, these folks are often uh, of, of lower means and may not even have bank accounts and so the grant programs actually uh, specify gift cards as a, as a best practice in that case. And then the Service Foundation also has some foster care assistance use cases there. So we wanted to you know, kind of corral the use cases, identify those, and then we'll continue to evaluate whether, what other options we have moving forward. Question. Yes. Does the, uh, the, the gift card liaison, is that, um, is that a person that reviews all the gift cards, even if a department head has reviewed? So that's a gatekeeper function, basically. Absolutely. Uh, so the process would be if you're in a department that has a, a, an authorized use case for those gift cards, you have to make that request to that liaison, which would be our procurement manager. Um, that request contains the purpose and the quantity and everything. Uh, and so he's actually tasked with procuring those, and there are reconciliations that take place uh, at two checkpoints along the way. So uh, we feel like that's a, a much more controlled process. Yeah, that's excellent. Thanks. So that takes us out of the four that we've talked about tonight and moves us into the next steps. Uh, so unless there are any other changes, our plan is to make those policies go into effect as of right now. Uh, so those updated versions will become county policy. Uh, the communications team have been great all the way through this process and they're standing by uh, ready to help departments get up to speed on what the changes are and what those impacts are to them. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, there's a plan to conduct periodic follow-up and see, okay, now that we've written uh, these new policies, we need to follow up with folks and see what the impact has actually been in, in, a, in a period of time and see if we need to make adjustments um, or uh, measure the impact and is it doing the things we intended. Uh, there's also those gatekeeper roles that we talked about as well, um, and so I won't rehash those, but we are allocating some additional resources uh, within the finance function sp specifically to make sure we're monitoring policy adherence and transactional analysis in the best way we can. Uh, we're developing a formal review structure for policies in the county. 
So once again, these, these ongoing policy reviews are just now being structured in a, in a way that includes you know, mo more people across the county. We're building those schedules out so this won't take, you know, this will happen on a recurring basis and that schedule will be predetermined. And then lastly, uh, next up to assess uh, are the policies you see listed there. So formal and informal bids, gas cards, petty cash, uh, mobile devices, and, and the list goes on. So that's the plan. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions, uh, but we appreciate your time and thank you for letting us make this update. <clears throat> I want to um, thank you all for, for this work and for um, senior leadership's initiative in this. Um, and as Mandy started off the presentation, there was one person that um, abused our system. And I think all the changes that have been made, whistleblower, um, I think the best thing about all of this is everything is so black and white that no longer can a superior influence a subordinate, an employee, and um, expect them to do something because the rules are outlined, it's clear, and you've given safe protections for people who have um, an issue. So thank you. Sorry, I have, a, I have a process question. Does this need to be voted on? Mm -mm. They are administrative policies that belong um, either to the county manager or CFO. We are looking for feedback from the board. I think the okay. board gave clear directive to the county <coughs> manager in this area. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. <coughs> then um, I do have a couple of comments, relatively small. Um, on the... Um, one of these, a couple of these are just kind of fairly small se semantics, but I just, you know, the details of this stuff, you know, we need to make sure we try to make it as clear as we can. Um, on the, so, so some of the new policies have to do with um, travel by commissioners, and, um, and so we're going to have this policy that if commissioners are going to travel to events other than, like, the county commissioner association meetings, those are sort of automatically, you know, if you want to go to those, that's great. But for other stuff, we're going to say that, um, either the chair or vice chair needs to approve it. So if a commissioner wants to go to some conference or something like that, you know, certainly that's, that can be good, but we want to have a process for getting a ch the chair or vice chair to um, approve that, correct? That's accurate. Okay. So just semantics in that. I think in the last sentence in that section, it says um, it sh and or, like either the chair and or the vice chair should do it. I think it should just be or, right, so that you don't have to do both or just to make that more clear. So that was just a, a small thing. <laughs> um, and the other question I guess I had on that, on that uh, travel item is, and that also, but that also relates to the county's um, senior staff too, right? Yes. So, if the, so if the county senior staff are going on, are doing travel, then that would also require approval from either the chair or the vice chair. Am I understanding that right? For the appointed positions um, and requires that I notify and that the CFO notify all members of the board if we're traveling. Okay, so, so there's approval a approval and notification. Okay, and so question on that in terms of approval, um, has it been decided exactly the mechanism for doing that? Like, is there going to be a form that needs to be signed, or is the simple email, or sort of? I'm just curious about the details of that if they've been worked out yet or if that's sort of to be worked out? Well, um, it, will re it will likely happen electronically through email, but we will want a record of that. Um, it, we ha have we ha as we have experienced in this first week of launching our new financial system is there's really no way for you all to do approvals within that system um, so because you're not users in that system on a regular basis. So I think an email that shows you've been notified of our intent to travel and there's actually been approval received by the chair or vice chair. Okay. And if you have a different suggestion, that's our intent tonight. Can I give her a suggestion on that? Sure. There's a, a um, you might look at DocuSign. Is that, you, do you hate that? No, I, I use it all the time. Do you use it all the time? Well, I just sure. I used it on something and it, it it's, Sure. Once your signature's on there, you just kind of hit a button and you, you've approved it. I don't know if that's a way to do it or not, sure. but it's just, you know, email's probably easier. And um, as we move toward the goal this summer, the online checkbook, and even beyond that, we have made the commitment to twice a year 
publicly present um, travel and expenditures related to both his CFO and the county manager to the public. Okay, and I, you know, I think if it's not already in the proposed policy, I think that for the commission too, I think we should just yeah. all be part of that, and so that you know, I think, I think a lot of these, a lot of these kind of things are are great to do, and you're, That's you, right. you know, and, and it should right. be encouraged, but I think they should just also be, you know, just just disclosed. It's in there for you as okay. well. Great. Let me see. Um, And just one other kind of detail question on this in terms of the travel so if you're going to go travel somewhere of course whatever mode of transportation you're using you know there's that cost but then there's also the event you're going to and so do like so if we're going to a conference for example did those approval processes also apply to the event you're traveling for as well as the actual sort of cost of tr transportation back and forth yes okay Yes, that's the way it is for employees who get approval through their department directors, and that would be true for the appointed positions where you all would be given approval. Okay, thank you. Those were my questions. So just uh, one, one question on, you know, there's going to be training and, you know, you're going to be, my, I, it's not really a concern. I just want to make sure that the process doesn't get in the way of things that is necessary for for you or others to do as far as training so you know waiting on an approval to go to you know we need to make sure that we work through that so it doesn't interfere with the training or with conferences that are necessary and needed um, I think that um, when both the CFO and I and I think that'd be true for the clerk to look at our schedules they're fairly set by either uh, finance conferences that the CFO goes to on an annual basis or ICMA for the county manager. So I don't think it'd be difficult to give those to you in advance, but I do feel like you're all accessible and the chair and vice chair are accessible if something <coughs> came up that was more of an emergence need. All right, other questions or feedback? All right. I, I just want to thank. I mean, the the combination of uh, of the peer review, uh, the way you put it together, uh, best practices, all of that. Um, it was really, it was very good. I mean, and I'm, I'm extremely pleased. It's it's, you know, it's in line with uh, best practices with some um, some some businesses that I've been associated with, and it's very, you know, it's just very good. I appreciate the detail. I'm not sure, it. Commissioner Boucher, if you're in the room, but do want to make the point that the Workday system provides us with more um, capacity to audit for irregularities and identify trends or outliers that require more in depth review. But um, Mr. Flores also worked to realign a position in his department that will take on that more traditional gatekeeper role looking right. for using those reports to help identify areas that might need to go to the internal auditor for further review so mr flores worked out a way to do that within his existing um, I, I, think, I think it's important to, to know that a gatekeeper function is not just to find the to Absolutely find those not. things or to catch someone or something like that but it's to improve the process is to see you know where the where the bumps are and where the exceptions are and, and once those exceptions are, are highlighted then you know you have the ability to change and change fast Absolutely. So, thanks thank you all all right thank you. Uh, Dustin and John thanks for your presentation on this and great work um, and we're ready to move on to the next mm -hmm. item. all right and the next item is a presentation by the North Carolina Department of Transportation and we have Kat Bukawi here to lead us on this item. Thank you for being with us. <coughs> Thank you. Aha, there it is. Yay. Always exciting when technology works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. The widening of I-26 from US-25 <laughs> south of Hendersonville to I-40, I-240 south of Asheville is a high priority project for NCDOT, as I'm sure you know. We're here today to focus on one specific aspect of the project, the replacement of the bridges over the French Broad River. Wow. 
and their potential impact on river users. I-26 will be widened to four lanes in both directions from US-25, Asheville Highway, and Henderson County up to I-40, I-240 in Buncombe County. This includes the two bridges over the French Broad River that will be replaced with one span. It was necessary to determine the methods of building the new bridge and taking down the old ones before construction begins. It's also important for NCDOT to implement safety procedures and alternatives for river users during the project. None of the construction will impact safety or usage downstream of the bridge. NCDOT will provide a safe passage lane in the water for river users that will include floating navigational aids to reduce the risk of accidents. NCDOT will also require the <coughs> contractor to install a catchment device on the structures to prevent construction material from falling on users or into the water. While developing these initial safety plans, NCDOT found there is no easy way to provide portage around the construction zone. The closest public pullout is at Bent Creek River Park, approximately one mile upstream of the bridges. Users would then have to drive from there about six miles on NC 191 Brevard Road to reach the next public put in at Hominy Creek River Park. Although it could be possible to provide a pull it out and put in at the bridges, this would require users to walk through an active construction zone. Providing a safe passage lane for the duration of construction is a safer and more reasonable option for anyone in a kayak, canoe, or raft. NCDOT recognizes that boat trips can begin well upstream as far as the headwaters in Transylvania County. Public access points are located at Westfield Park and Horseshoe Park in Henderson County and at Bent Creek River Park in Buncombe County. Working with appropriate partners, NCDOT will place signage at boat access locations to alert river users to the construction downstream. NCDOT will also advise the public through other means such as the website and social media. Boats will be, need to, will be funneled into safe passage <coughs> lanes because causeways are needed for the bridge replacement and construction. To reach those causeways, <coughs> access roads will be built alongside I-26 within NCDOT right-of-way using retaining walls to stay off private property and protect natural resources. There will be one causeway on each side of the river. On the east side, the causeway will be completely installed during the first stage of construction. It will run about 318 feet along the bank and extend 52 feet into the river. It will be removed as construction progresses. On the west side, the causeway will be built in stages until it reaches 320 feet in length and extends 62 feet from the riverbank. Depending on the work, the causeways will also have additional short extensions of 10 to 21 feet into the river. Again, safety for river users is a priority and they will be funneled to the safe passage lane. During the final stage, a causeway will be built to remove the center columns of the existing bridge. The safe passage lane will be adjusted for the final construction stage. Hydraulics experts have examined how the causeway will impact river users, river levels, excuse me, and depth, and the result is that less than one inch during average rain events and a one-foot increase at the causeway during a 100-year storm event will occur. So that's less than one inch during an average rain event, the river will come up, and about a foot during a 100-year storm event. With the temporary causeways in place, a 100-year event would raise the river level 10 inches, about a half mile upriver, 
and that would have no new impacts to existing buildings. These buildings are already in the 100-year floodplain. The rise would decrease with distance to six inches at one mile upstream and two inches two miles upstream before completely dissipating three miles upstream of the bridge. Thank you for listening to our update on the replacement of the I-26 bridges over the French Broad River and their potential effects on river users, river dependent businesses, and upstream properties. We will be conducting small group meetings to inform other stakeholders of these plans. In addition, a public meeting for the entire project will be held next Monday, this coming Monday, April 16th from 4 to 7 p.m. at Biltmore Baptist Church. A local officials informational meeting, which you already have received the invitation to, will be held beforehand from 2 to 3 p.m. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? <coughs> so this is just um, <coughs> this is just relevant. To, thank you for being here and for the uh, update. <laughs> the, the the this is just relevant to the I-26 crossing um, on I-26 about a mile or two south of the. Uh, Biltmore Mall interchange is that yes. right? Yes. It's just so that it's crossing of the French Broad is where this is. It's relevant. just above yeah. the Blue Ridge Parkway okay. bridge over I-26 and just south of. Just the replacement of NC that of that bridge. It doesn't have anything to do with the crossing of French Broad River in downtown Asheville. No. It's just the not one this south project. Okay. Nope. N no. Uh, <laughs> nope. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Not 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 me. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I think you back up on one of them. I think that is incorrect. Don't mean anything. If it's the right place, you had mile marker 61. Is it not? Mm, I don't think so. I think that should be around 38 or something like that. 36, 37, 38. Okay. If it's one downstream of uh, Bent Creek Church, it's that first bridge before the parkway, right? Yes. Between Biltmore Square Mile and uh, Biltmore Park. Mm -hmm. No. Yes? Yeah. So them exits so are 33, 38? 37. And I think I've seen 61 up there. And you that did. would be the Henderson County then. Okay. I will change that. Thank well, you I mean, for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the infrastructure that will be put into the river for the construction purposes, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. So that's going to be temporary. So it will be installed yeah. for the construction and then it will be removed once the highway improvement project is complete. Right, the causeways are there for as work pads to stage cranes and other items needed okay. to construct or demolish the bridge. Uh, and as work progresses, they will be removed. The one side gets fully put in in stage one and it's removed as it goes. The other side, because it's approaching from the opposite direction, it will get completely built out and then it will be removed at the you know, at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for being Thank with you. us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. You too. All right. <clears throat> Next up, uh, Tim Flora will present the FY18 financial audit contract. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, tonight I'm asking uh, your approval of the fiscal year 2018 financial audit contract. Uh, in January, the county decided to go request to do a request for proposal for a new auditing firm as it had been four years since uh, we had done such a thing. Um, the selection committee uh, was made up of six people, which was three people from our uh, audit committee and three county staff members. Uh, we received five proposals. Uh, I might say they were all very good proposals that we received from each of those firms and we narrowed it down to three firms to interview and I will say that one of those firms that we did interview was our current auditor, uh, Gould Killian. Um, ultimately, uh, the selection committee believed that the best fit for Buncombe County was Clifton Larson Allen, uh, also known as CLA. Uh, some information about uh, Clifton Larson and Allen, to which I will say CLA from here on out, is that they are a top ten firm. They, uh, I believe they are the ninth largest uh, accounting firm in the country. Uh, they have more than 55,000 professionals in over 100 locations. 
Uh, they have over 600 professionals dedicated specifically to state and local governments. Um, they are ranked number one in the nation in performing single audits. And for those of you who do know what, don't know what a single audit is, that is a federal requirement as part of our regular financial audit that has to be performed. And I think Assistant County Manager Jim Holland could attest to that they are quite grueling. <laughs> um, uh, they have over 2,100 governmental clients. Uh, Buncombe County will actually be the first client of theirs, uh, first county client in the state of North Carolina, although they have done work for uh, the state treasurer's office. Um, other counties, uh, just as a benchmark for uh, the, the, the number of counties they do, they do several counties, uh, but it includes uh, in states like Colorado, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, Florida, Arizona, uh, Illinois. The contract amount is $418,000. Uh, in this first year um, and uh, that is sort of an overview of that. Uh, I would like to give thanks to our controller Jennifer Durrett who has uh, coordinated uh, this audit uh, selection process and also I would like to give thanks to the three audit committee members uh, that we had who also served on this selection committee which was Danny Yelton, Kendra Ferguson and Mike Nepshield. Um, the search committee presented its, recommenda uh, its recommendation to the audit committee last month in its meeting, and uh, upon that recommendation, the audit committee did recommend that uh, this uh, audit contract come before you uh, to be approved. And so with that, I'm glad to entertain any of your questions. All right, any questions? Or a motion? And we will... Uh, All right, motion and a second. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on the motion? All right, Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. I'd like to have some clarification on the previous one that Mandy's team had presented about the cards and the mills and those policies and things you said you wasn't voting on it this particular item that you're talking about here with the local government and all that is going to be pertaining to those cards as well so i'd like to know why you didn't vote if it's going to be a, a board action uh, for policy changes on cards and the things that Mandy's team presented, because this here is just part of of that, because you're going to be taking money out if you're going to use cards, right? Okay, I confused you. Uh, that's good. That's my job. So I'd like to know why you didn't vote on Mandy's if it's updating policies, because this, this here with the local government commission is just an extension of that. Okay, thank you. Maybe you can get somebody else to explain it better. All right, thanks. All right. So I, I'll take a stab at answering the question. <laughs> I think the, uh, the reason that the previous issue did not require vote is that they're administrative policies, and so the staff do have the authority to uh, amend administrative policies from time to time, and, and they've proposed that, and <coughs> but they did want to make the public and the commission aware of what they were and seek feedback. But and it did I, not require a vote of the commissioners for those administrative changes. This is a vote to actually hire an, an auditor, and, and that does require a vote of the county commissioners. Right. And, and I believe Mr. Rice is probably thinking about the next presentation that I have, which we split. Yes. With, yes. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. that's all right. So, And uh, which is, what's the next thing on the agenda? Uh, electronic the electronic payments. payments. Okay, we'll get to that, we'll get to that next. All right, well, there's a motion and a second. Any questions or additional comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Mr. Flora, you wanna take the next one on the electronic payments item. So the next is a resolution authorizing Buncombe County to engage in electronic payments. And so this is something that we've probably been doing for the past 20 years. And it's a situation where the uh, resolution is about the state playing catch up with technology. So last month, uh, we received a memo from uh, the department or the uh, um, local government commission uh, in regarding some um, out 
outdated rules, but also providing updated rules uh, around electronic payments. And specific to the electronic payments is the uh, pre-audit requirement. And so I don't know if, if you understand what a pre-audit is or a pre-audit certificate. That is where uh, I, as the finance director, am certifying that there is budget and uh, funding available to make a purchase. Um, and in certain electronic payments, it's difficult to have that electronic certificate, which is actually a very specific language and a stamp on a document. It is very hard to have that pre-audit certificate uh, on a purchase on like a P-card purchase because someone is going to a store and making a purchase and so I'm not there with them to certify that yes, there's, there's budget there. And so what this is is updating rules that allows us to uh, exempt ourselves from the pre-audit certificate, not the pre-audit process. And so I wanna make that clear. It's just, it's just that language that has to go on a receipt. So basically in essence, for the last number of years, all states in North Carolina have been out of compliance with laws around the pre-audit certificate. So this resolution is a step into helping us be in compliance uh, with, those, with those rules. And so part of those requirements is the adoption by you, the board, uh, of a resolution allowing governments to, one, make electronic payments. And then after that, it's allowing uh, me as the uh, finance director to adopt policies around electronic payments. And then also there are some training requirements that, that would go along with that. And then finally, there's, there are some quarterly reporting requirements that would go along that where we would adjust some of our quarterly reporting to actually show you that there are actually encumbrances out there. So um, this is uh, a very administrative in nature. Um, we have those policies in place and in fact, uh, we have to make very few changes to the processes we already had existing because we really were already checking to make sure that we had uh, uh, documented uh, sufficient budget and funds prior to PCAR purchases. Now we just actually have to include it into our electronic system, which is um, something that we will be able to do with our, with our new financial system workday. So with that, I would also entertain any questions you might have. So that was clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> that is why uh, I'm probably the only one that's going to be straight up honest. It, I mean, it, it is a, so. I so mean, really. the guidance came from the local government commission, and I think we all had that discussion that no one was going to understand the really sort of the administrative minutia it, uh, it requires in, uh, in 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 doing pre audits. But this this is what basically what we're doing is we're authorizing the county to make electronic payments. Um, and then set up policies and procedures around that, which is something we have already done. Okay, so I have a, a question, mm -hmm. okay, about the setting up of policies and procedures. Yes. Okay, who's doing that? Who's checking that? Who's making sure right. the test's done, done in a so, proper so fashion? That is, so, so in this More than one person. Yeah, so in this resolution, you are giving me that responsibility to do it, but it, it is a team of, of, of my folks that they're actually establishing those policies. And, and, it's, and, and the local government commission is very specific about the rules. So they give us the guidance from the state and we are just making sure that we take those policies and procedures and put it in our, uh, update our, our policies and procedures and make sure that we adhere to those. Okay, so no offense intended, but um, who, th are the rules so specific that they check up, that that's the check up on you or does someone else check up? you know, to make sure that the policies and procedures that you're putting in, in place are in line with, with uh, the, the statutes or someone's approving those, because those aren't coming back to us, right? Right, right. Okay. And so, so um, they are with, very specific. The, 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 the local government is very specific about that, and so that will be something that our financial, our external financial auditors will, uh, will verify, as well as, I suspect, uh, our internal audit department as well will, will periodically... Uh, uh, okay. Can I get a nod from the internal auditor? Okay, all right. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Thank yeah, you. But this will be something that our external our, our external financial auditors will will do because it is clearly outlined by the state. Thanks. The, the and is there is there any reason that the um, policies that you draft wouldn't be reviewed by the audit committee or by the commission? I mean, this again, uh, uh, this is sounds like pretty technical stuff. It, it, so, but so any reason that you know I have they the policy can't be and I'm more than happy to. To, to post it or run it by the audit committee, um, I, I think that would be that would be something um, very appropriate to do. So if you like, I, I will have this drafted and run it through the audit committee uh, for their review. Okay. Um, 
and we can it, it will be posted i can imagine we could even post yeah, it online i would say we need That's, that okay terrific sure. thank you oh, i got one question yes sir uh, well i understand it comes back to you tim but i think we've kind of all worked together that mandy stays in the picture of it too the county manager so it needs to, to come to her too so she knows what's happening sure absolutely okay <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions, or is there a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right. There's a motion and a second. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on the motion? All right. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Okay. We now come to the board appointments. Hey. <clears throat> we have on the planning board. We have three. Uh, members who are up for reappointment. I'll nominate Dusty Plass, Thad Lewis, Robert Martin. Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. On the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee, there's <laughs> 10 vacancies and we have six uh, applicants, three of whom are reappointments. God bless them. <laughs> I'll make a motion to appoint Judy McDonahue, Robert DeBrule, Jean Knopfel, Stephen Heidi, Lori Hollinsworth, and Patty Turberfield. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And on the Mountain Area Workforce Development Board, there's two reappointments and one replacement when you have the three applicants. I'll make a motion to appoint Thomason Davis, Sarah Bergeron, and Susan Garrett. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's it. All right. Um, we now come to public comment. Uh, the time limit for individual comment to the board is three minutes. If your time expires, you can leave any questions along with your name, address, and phone number with the county manager. Board members are not expected to comment on any matters during public comment. This is the public's chance to speak to the commission. And the board reserves to write the right to deny public address on issues that we have previously voted on and already had specific comment on earlier in the meeting. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment at this time? Uh, yes, sir. Come on up and please share your name and uh, where, you, where you live. My name is John Johnson, and uh, I have a farm in Sandy Mush where I've lived since 1977. I'm coming to the commission uh, to uh, basically say something that you probably are very well aware of, and that is that the internet system in the rural areas of our county really stink. Uh, they are more than three times less than the power of the urban and suburban area. Nevertheless, the farmers in our area, and I won, need internet more and more for management, best practices, research, and marketing. The young people in the county also need internet more and more uh, because the school lessons require it of them. Um, the uh, people in the county uh, where I live, a lot of them work out of their homes. And they need the internet, and I'm one of those also. And they need the internet to, to do that, <clears throat> to upload large documents, to manage websites, and so forth. Uh, where I'm going with this, I'm sure you're aware. Uh, you all have approved uh, in your last budget the uh, Sandy Mush Community Center's hotspot. And I just really basically want to thank you for that because I have often had to go there because my system, which is only has three MPSs, just would not, was too slow to deal with the material that I needed to get up. So I drove over to the center for that to happen on more than one occasion. And I know many of my friends and neighbors have done the same. So basically, in a nutshell, I'm hoping that you will renew that the next time it comes for a vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Michael. Mm 
Good evening, Commissioners and Chairman Newman. My name is Michael Harney. I was last in front of you February 6th, and I thank you, uh, Chairman Belcher, uh, Commissioner Belcher, rather, for inviting the public to talk about needle exchange and the importance of it in our community. So this is the second lesson. I uh, want to give you a little bit more history about it, and I could talk for hours, but with three minutes, I'm going to have to keep coming back. I want to uh, tell you that in 1993, Commissioner uh, Fryer, your brother was very influential in providing me access to Marty Prairie Chicken, who was the uh, prevention educator at the Western North Carolina AIDS Project. You know that I work at the Western North Carolina AIDS Project. I operate the Needle Exchange Program of Asheville and still teach at both AB Tech and at Blue Ridge Community Colleges. So it was Art Fryer, uh, the now deceased but uh, very gracious gentleman, who forced me to go and speak to Marty Prairie Chicken. I made a 20% donation from some necklaces that I was selling at Scandals, one of our local uh, gay bars and now a dance club, very famous in this community, all those years ago in 1993. So I thank you, sir, for sharing him with us. But had I not met him, I would never have uh, known about <coughs> needle exchange and the importance of it to our community. So 24 years later, we still haven't come to the conclusion that we need to fund it in a way that is sufficient. And this is how I see needle exchange. The fact that people don't have access to clean needles sometimes seems a tragedy to me as a public health issue. To me, it is a primary issue of public health. Secondary issues of legality, of morality, of financial are all secondary issues to the fact that people should have access and a blanket protection if we have needles in our possession. And so I am very grateful to uh, Sheriff Van Duncan. He actually bought us some uh, clippers for the needles, and they went so fast. I would love to have another 1,000 of them if he had them in his budget uh, to send them to us. But people found them very useful in uh, clipping off the needles, which also reduced the risk of other people being stuck by needles in our community. So uh, that is really important to us. I would like um, to, to continue this conversation and think that if we ever went to the health department to get our flu shot, a nurse would never pull out of a sharps container a, uh, a needle that was used yesterday. And so I don't see at what point we lose our humanity when we step out of a healthcare setting that we don't have access to clean needles, that we have as many as we need, that we learn about <coughs> prevention, that we learn about disposal, proper disposal. And uh, I'd like to continue this conversation. On a completely secondary tangent from this, but somewhat harm reduction to our uh, climate and to our environment, I would hope that the Commission in future um, uh, building permits also would ask that we put um, solar panels on buildings, on the roofs of buildings. I feel like we are, um, are losing an opportunity to gather some of the solar power on the this top of what you know used to be the BB&T building, on the top of Walmarts, on the top of hospitals, on the top of schools and anywhere else. So those are some things that were on my mind tonight and I'll see you again. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Valeria Watson, and I will disclose that I'm a new commissioner on the Historic Resources Commission. And um, I, I always get a little troubled when uh, people say they don't see race in this. As an African American, I'll soon be 70, and I have not, I've always been impacted and limited by the structures of white supremacy. So if, if we don't admit that it exists, and it exists in all of our systems. And that's not a criticism, but how can we deal with the problem if we refuse to admit that it exists? Now, if you're white and you live in uh, privilege, you may not know that. But part of that has been our fault. I was brought up that you didn't tell white people because they didn't want to hear it. I was brought up in segregation. So it's, this is a new time. We're speaking. And people who have been quieted sometimes don't know if they're shouting too loud or they have to speak, you know, what's their inside voice? So we're attempting to find that voice and to have discussions. So we're not polarized. And, you know, there's not just the activists and then the good people and the police. It, it just doesn't, man, it doesn't exist like that. I live in Leicester. Half the people I hang out with our good old boys out in the country. And th that's my family. So I want us to just start seeing each other as people who are invested in living here and making Asheville live up to the story it promotes about all of us, you know, the good stuff. 
and we can do this, but we're trying to have conversations. So I work with Black Lives Matter, I work with A Surge, but I also work with the city. And I've been working with sister cities since 2006. Bring, and we're bringing a delegation of Nigerians here again. So we're doing things to build a foundation of support for the African American community who don't even know they're African, okay? Because that's what slavery did to us. And so I feel like you guys need to go to A Surge or have some diversity training so you really understand the issues and you stop taking it personal. It's, it's not personal, but it becomes personal every day I walk out my door because I don't know what white person in this town is gonna either say something, is gonna touch my hair, is gonna say something offensive to me. And that's my daily experience as a black woman, an educated black woman who's gone to Columbia University every day in this town, okay? So the promise of Asheville isn't fulfilled for us, and that's all I'm asking. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Yes, sir. How's it going, folks? My name is Britt. I live in Leicester, North Carolina. Um, I didn't intend to speak today, but I heard that you don't see race, and that really made me angry, you know? And I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to try to control my anger. I have some notes here. You don't see color. And that's a, that, that stems from white fear and white supremacy. It, it, um, it, it erases the reality that my partner faces every day. The other people of color, Mexican, black, Indian, Pakistani, whatever. If you're not white, you're out in this town. You are a target by people who aren't even aware of their own privilege and their own disease in their mind. It's a disease. It forces you to not, it, it blinds you to see people and what they face every day. You get to go to the grocery store every day when you need without getting pulled over, without you get to cross the street, without anybody harassing you. That's white supremacy. And me calling you out on it, it's probably gonna, it, it, it's, it's, it's just mind-numbing. And then, and then the activists get looped into the enemy side, too. It's just like, and then you're talking, you're conflate, uh, uh, Commissioner Belcher, you're conf I, I appreciate the commissioner next to you pointing out that you're conflating local issues with national rhetoric. That, that's, it's like, you, you, you showed me that's how you think. So you, you're just one person out of a group of people that think the same way. And we're trying to figure out why it's so hard just to have a conversation. When white supremacy is the order of the day here in 2018, when a grown man can say he don't see color and not a single one of y'all stepped up to say what? Hello, that is how white supremacy works. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless, you know, and you should be ashamed of yourself frankly, because you have so much power and so much in your voice just by being, being able to sit up here and say I or nay. You, you, you're with a stroke of a pen. What were you doing in the 70s in urban renewal? I don't even know. I want to find out, though. I want to find out who is still in power. Who is still, who's still uh, accountable to that time when we thought it was okay to kick people out of their homes? And what, what, if we, what have we done as a city? I am from this town. My mother's family's from this town. So more and more, I, I'm, I'm ready to wake up and get to work. So thank you all for your time. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I've gotten used to this buzzer and it goes really quick, so I'm gonna talk kind of fast, okay? I ask everyone in this room, close your eyes, close them and keep them closed, the, the whole portion that I'm talking. I do that because I wanna take race off the table. Not that I don't see it, but it has no, no argument where I stand right now. So hear my words, not what I look like and how I carry myself. 
So what I'm here to say is opioid epidemic. It's been almost our five month anniversary since we all became friends. All of y'all, you may not know, but behind your backs, I call you all my best friends because the county has been stepping up for Candler. I see Mountain Mobility presence out in Candler a lot more. I see uh, the building of a hub that is absolutely beautiful. You awarded our library money. You awarded our parks money. I love you all and you are my best friend, even though Mr. Brownie, we haven't met firsthand or Ms. Jasmine, you either. Now, um, I give you accolades for that. However, I have to say it's not enough. I'm coming to you, our county commissioners, because I've been to Asheville. I've been to the city. I've tried to do everything that you guys do, even going to the meeting where both of you guys sat down at the table, and there's a huge lack of communication. And I'm not pointing blame, I'm not taking sides. What I'm, I'm coming to you because I've gone to Asheville to tell them that the transit system is not okay. My understanding, Asheville city limits go to the Inca red light. Mr. Belcher, you know where that is. But I tell them that, that's 2.6 miles that the buses don't cover, but you go past city limits 10 miles to Black Mountain. That's not okay for me, but they're not willing to take responsibility for that part of the city. But our commissioners here, our county commissioners, you guys have stepped up and I appreciate that. So I'm more willing to come to the table and talk to you guys on behalf of Candler because I was told to advocate for the bus lines because in my opinion, that's where it comes down to with the opioid epidemic. People in Candler, they can't get to the parole officers. We can't get to court. We can't come be a part of these discussions. We can't come be part of all these boards because we don't have that public transportation. Not your fault. Again, you guys are stepping up to the table, which I appreciate greatly. But if we can't get out of Candler into where the jobs are and all that, how, how are we going to benefit? How are we going to prosper? How are we going to be sustainable for the future? We, we can't do that ourselves. Oh, one minute left. Oh, that does go fast. <laughs> Again, I just wanted to say uh, against Mr. Rice's recommendations that I did want to give you accolades for what you have done, but just know that it's not enough. And Mr. Belcher, I will be taking your words to heart that I will be a fly on the ear, that I will continue to be annoying. I will continue to be in the faces of the people who matter and make these decisions because Candler can't get out here. Uh, also, uh, against the opioid epidemic, everything I do goes back to that. Next Monday, April 16th, I'll be meeting with Mount Morency. We've been working with the faith communities in order to pull together to plan stuff for Candler, and we're planning a drop-off point on April 28th. Mr. Belcher, I was told to call you. I thought that was a little rude. You as well, Mr. Presley. So I invite all of our county commissioners to come out to Mount Morency, get free food. Everybody's welcome. You won't be preached at. We'll be getting together about the opioid epidemic and what we need to do to get that drop-off point started. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for everything that you continue to do for your community and for your people of Candler. Just know we still need more and we need to work together continuously. Oh, that was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> you're learning, you're getting it. Good nice job. job. Nailed it. Yes, sir, in the back. My name is Jim Reeves. I live in Buncombe County. I'm here to ask the commissioners if they think it is appropriate to have someone instructing future law enforcement officers that will be sworn to uphold the Constitution while having such contempt for the supreme law they, they swear an oath to that he jokes about killing Americans, your constituents, that exercise their natural right recognized as pre-existing under the Second Amendment for self-defense. I would ask if you think the person is fit to hold the position of sheriff, the highest law, law enforcement officer in the county, while holding the law he's supposed to uphold in such contempt. I would remind you that the Second Amendment's very purpose is for Americans to protect themselves from out-of-control government officials, such as those that they believe they are the law and can threaten harm to citizens that recognize they have an inalienable natural right in self-defense. I demand this person be terminated immediately or funding be withheld from AB Tech until this person is held to account. Uh, I hope the voters will recognize the, the threat to their safety as well as the safety of his officers by this divisive candidate. Law enforcement is certainly not held in very high esteem by a large percentage of the community. I hope the voters will not add to that by electing someone who will make lawful gun owners suspicious of whether a partisan political agenda will have priority over protecting their natural rights. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, mine goes back to Mandy's policy stuff that she presented here with her team. And my question is, if these are policies, they're adopted by the board, or is that her administrative policies and they don't hold no weight with the board? Which is it? Now, if it is policies, and I, it sure sounds like that to me, why wouldn't it voted on tonight? Now, my concern is that I've 
made some requests and I've got most of them and there's two requests that's still outstanding that I haven't got. One is a personnel that I requested back in December. I haven't got it and it's being held up by the attorney and the HR and Mandy knows about it as well. Now, they said when the new system went in that some of this data wouldn't be there anymore and I want to know. I want my request filled. The new system goes in. I still want my data because you're going to have to preserve what you preserve and what you're going to get rid of. Don't trash it because I've already requested it. By law, I'm entitled to it and they know it very specifically. And the attorney even said three and a half years to get me this information. He needs to go somewhere and get some law degree that understand North Carolina law. And the other thing is that I requested uh, the meals. I wanted to know from each department how much money was spent on meals. My answer back was that we're going to have a presentation today and that would be took care of in the new system going forward. I don't care about the new system going forward. I want to know my answer to my public information and I want it because number one, you commissioners ought to ask the question yourself. Because if you don't know what the meals are and how much you've been paying in the past, and if they can't come up with that receipt, I'd say the FBI needs to come in here and, and check on that. Because you know what? FBI's, when they come in, they don't come in because somebody rung the big bell. It's because these little things, these little transactions called the card. You hear me? That's how they get in. And that's where they start at. Because if you lie about one little thing, <laughs> you lie about a big one. So I want my public information. I'm saying it right out. And you can talk with the attorney, and you can talk with the HR, and you can talk with Mandy. It's all in writing, and I'd like to have it fulfilled. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, my name is Diana Starr. I'm a 20-year resident of Buncombe County. My remarks are just very brief tonight. Um, I just want to thank and acknowledge and applaud the com commissioners Beach, Ferrara, Frost, and Whitesides for their efforts and attempts to bring genuine integrity, transparency, and accountability to the Sheriff's Office. I will be submitting further comments in writing. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I do have a short announcement to make. Uh, yes, there it is. On April 17th at 5 p.m. will be the next regular meeting of the Board of County Commissioners here at 200 College Street, room 326. And on April 24th at 12.30 p.m., there will be a strategic partnership grant presentation at 200 College Street, room 326. Thank you. And we do have a need for a closed session this evening. And Mr. Free, would you um, remind us what its topic uh, is being covered? Yes, sir. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3, we have a legal matter update for the commission. And pursuant to A6, two personnel matters to discuss with the commission. We just anticipate direction from the board. Okay, so no action expected when we uh, reconvene into open session. We expect to simply adjourn at that time. We need a motion to. Yeah, yes. That, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to acknowledge the passing of someone within our community. Uh, so, uh, uh, this week. Because I need to turn it on. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, this this week uh, we lost uh, someone in our, in our community, uh, Dr. J. Wendell Runyon, who has spoken here. Um, Commissioner Whiteside, many many others know uh, know him as a uh, a pastor and a and a uh, missionary and uh, and led the uh, broadcast of uh, two local radio stations for a long time and had many conversations here in a very in a very pleasant way and and uh, he um, he was an example of his faith to the community and leadership and cared about Buncombe County and and we we're very sorrowful for that loss and uh, extend our condolences to his uh, his his family and their uh, uh, the arrangements are, are later this week at Anders Rice thank you chairman 
Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to go into closed session? Second. There's a motion that second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. All right. We are in closed session. <laughs>